Welcome to Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom, the show where we crack open the mysteries of our own biology and try not to trip over the jargon. I'm Ethan Foster, your friendly, somewhat curmudgeonly guide through the labyrinth of natural health theories. I observe the human condition from the sidelines, occasionally cheering and occasionally rolling my eyes. And with me is the brilliant, sharp-witted Alara Skye, a mind so quick she practically comes with a speed limit. A speed limit I routinely ignore, by the way. Thanks for that introduction, Ethan. I prefer to think of myself as your comedic co-pilot, though sometimes I do wonder if you're just letting me do the navigating while you sip coffee in the back seat. I'd say I'm more of a front seat passenger who occasionally points out interesting landmarks. You do the complicated stuff, like making sense of metabolic pathways and explaining why glucose is apparently the star of the cellular fuel show. That's precisely what we're tackling today. Dr. Mercola's insights guide us into the world of mitochondria, those tiny engines in our cells, and the reasons glucose often gets top billing on the fuel list. Ready to jump in? Absolutely. Although I hear glucose, and I immediately think of all the times I surrendered to a donut, let's see if we can reframe that into something less guilt-inducing and more educational. Educational is our middle name around here. Let's start with an overview. Most people know mitochondria generate ATP, adenosine triphosphate, a small molecule that basically powers everything from muscle contractions to the unrelenting desire to scroll through social media. The question Dr. Mercola poses is, why is glucose so efficient at creating ATP? And why might it even be considered the best fuel for the human body? Let's talk about the big oxygen question. As I understand it, one of glucose's big selling points is that it produces more ATP per molecule of oxygen consumed compared to fat, right? Correct. Think of it this way. You've got a limited oxygen budget, especially in moments when you're huffing and puffing, like running up a flight of stairs. You want the best return on that precious oxygen. Glucose tends to deliver a higher ATP return per oxygen molecule than fats do. So, if you're in a situation where oxygen supply is limited, glucose is basically that efficient friend who accomplishes more in less time, right? Exactly. Glucose is the friend who wakes up early, bakes a cake, runs a 5K, and still has enough energy to chat with you about quantum physics. Meanwhile, fat shows up a bit LATA air, can do a whole lot of heavy lifting, but it demands a big chunk of oxygen to get the job done. It's not as nimble in low oxygen scenarios. That's because glucose can do glycolysis, which doesn't require oxygen at all, yes? Gold star for paying attention. During intense exercise, or if you're just sprinting to catch the ice cream truck, your muscles can still partially rely on glucose through glycolysis, even when oxygen is playing hide-and-seek. Fat can't really do that trick. So that means, if I decide to go for a quick sprint, at least I know my body has a backup plan, courtesy of glucose. Now, let's address this idea of reductive stress that Dr. Mercola mentions. It sounds like the lesser-known sibling of oxidative stress. It kind of is. Typically, you hear about oxidative stress, the buildup of reactive oxygen species, or ROS, which are like tiny sparks that can damage cells if not properly balanced. Reductive stress is sort of the flip side. If your cells get overloaded with electrons, essentially too many negative charges, they can end up spinning off just as many damaging sparks. Wait, we can get hammered either way? Too many electrons, too few electrons, it's all trouble. Balance is everything. Think of it like your home's electrical system. You can fry your circuits with an overload. In biological terms, if your mitochondria are forced to shuttle around too many electrons, they start generating more ROS. That can damage DNA, proteins, and basically cause cellular chaos. That's where fats enter the picture, right? Because they produce more FADH2 compared to NADH, which apparently triggers that electron overload. Precisely. When glucose is broken down, you primarily get NADH, an electron carrier that enters the electron transport chain at complex I. This is early in the chain, so the electrons have a smooth pathway and can generate a nice yield of ATP without building up too much negative charge in one place. Meanwhile, FADH2 from fat enters the chain at complex 2. That's like trying to board a train after it's already pulled away, isn't it? More or less, yes. You lose some efficiency, and the risk of building up electrons in the system goes up. That can translate into higher ROS formation, those damaging sparks. So, in your analogy, glucose is the well-behaved student who arrives for class early, politely raising their hand. Fat is the student who shows up late, busting through the door, and might inadvertently knock over a desk or two. Precisely. Now, we're not saying fat is useless. It's crucial for long-term energy storage. But from a day-to-day -day efficiency and cellular stress perspective, glucose generally shines a bit brighter. I'm noticing a pattern. Glucose is faster, can do its job even with less oxygen, and doesn't produce as many harmful byproducts. But is that the whole story? Because I recall reading something about how glucose also doubles as a building block for other metabolic pathways. You're on a roll, Ethan. Yes, glucose is a multi-talented performer. It's not just about fueling your muscles. It helps create new glucose from proteins through a process called gluconeogenesis. And there's also glycogenesis, 
where extra glucose is stored as glycogen in your liver and muscles. So if we eat a bit more carbs than we need, our body essentially tucks it away in these cute little glycogen bundles for later? Exactly. It's the original meal prep plan. And then there's the pentose phosphate pathway, which doesn't get as much fanfare, but it's key for producing NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate. NADPH is like a specialized delivery service for electrons used in various constructive processes, and ribose 5-phosphate is used to build the backbone of DNA and RNA. Wait, so carbs help us make genetic material too? In a roundabout way, yes. Ribose 5-phosphate is essential for DNA and RNA. Without it, your cells can't divide or repair themselves properly. Glucose's contributions to the pentose phosphate pathway help generate that ribose sugar. You see why it's not just about sugar for fuel, but about sugar as a fundamental building block. That's quite a resume. But, as with all things, isn't there a catch if you overdo glucose? Absolutely. Chronically high glucose levels can lead to glycation, where sugars bind to proteins in ways that cause them to function poorly. These are called AGs, advanced glycation end products. They're like sticky gunk that clogs up the cellular works. And that's why high blood sugar can lead to issues with nerves, blood vessels, and so on, like in type 2 diabetes. Exactly. When your insulin sensitivity decreases, your cells don't take up glucose efficiently. So you have sugar floating in your bloodstream, causing havoc, and your cells starve for fuel anyway. It's a lose-lose scenario. That ironically underscores how balance is everything. Too little glucose and you're missing out on efficiency. Too much and you're basically making tar that gums up your proteins. Perfectly stated. There's also the risk of increased ROS when glucose is chronically high. Your cells become stressed, mitochondria take a hit, and then you produce less ATP overall. It's a downward spiral. So controlling glucose intake and maintaining insulin sensitivity is critical to staying on the positive side of this metabolic seesaw. Now, let's zero in on a situation where the body's craving that quick, efficient ATP. Dr. Mercola points out that in scenarios like heart or brain stress, you need a fuel source that yields maximum ATP for minimal oxygen. Exactly. Imagine you have a clogged artery in the heart. Oxygen supply drops dramatically. The heart tissue can adapt somewhat, but it really needs a fuel that doesn't guzzle oxygen. Glucose fits that bill better than fat in that crisis. Our brains also rely heavily on glucose under normal conditions. We can adapt to use ketones if needed, but that's a different physiological scenario. Day to day, the brain is hungry for glucose. Yes, the brain is a glucose hog. It's about 2% of your body weight, but uses around 20% of your daily energy. It's the brilliant diva of your organ system. Now, what about that idea some folks tout, that a low-carb diet is the only healthy way to go? This obviously complicates the question of glucose as the best fuel. It does. But Dr. Mercola isn't saying we should consume endless amounts of sugar. He's highlighting that glucose is biologically efficient. People can adapt to different diets, especially if they're metabolically flexible. But the underlying science is that glucose has these unique advantages. High ATP per oxygen, low risk of reductive stress if balanced properly, plus the ability to create energy in low oxygen conditions. So, the short version, we need enough glucose to fuel our cells and keep everything balanced, but we also need to avoid drowning in sugar. In other words, please enjoy that banana, but maybe skip the triple frosted donut? Right. The nuance is in the balance. Health also depends on insulin sensitivity, which ensures that glucose actually enters cells instead of hanging around in your bloodstream, throwing wild parties. And let's circle back to the fat versus glucose thing. Fat is a crucial part of our physiology, especially for long-term energy storage. But the daily, heavy lifting duties go more smoothly with glucose? Indeed, especially in contexts like exercise or short bursts of energy demand. Fat is your warehouse for energy. Glucose is your quick access fuel. Dr. Merkel's point is that from a cellular perspective, glucose is less likely to produce excessive ROS and more likely to yield good returns on ATP. Fat's not the enemy. It's just not always the star quarterback in your metabolic playbook. I do love a good sports metaphor. Let's talk a little about these electron carriers again, NADH versus FADH2, since that's a big part of why glucose is so effective. When you metabolize glucose, you predominantly get NADH, which enters the electron transport chain at complex I. That's the entire length of the chain, so you get more ATP out of each electron. Fats generate more FADH2, which jumps in at complex two, so you effectively skip that first big chunk. You lose some potential ATP in that process and risk a backlog of electrons, which can generate more ROS. So it's not just about how much energy is stored in the fuel, but also how gracefully that energy flows through your cellular machinery. Exactly. If you flood the system improperly, you get those sparks, the reactive oxygen species, which can cause oxidative damage. Glucose is gentler on the electron transport chain, again, provided we're dealing with healthy metabolic conditions. I'm seeing that if your glucose levels are excessively high, that gentleness goes out the window and you can cause damage through other means, like glycation. 
So, there really is a sweet spot, pun fully intended, where glucose works best. Pun accepted. Yes, a sweet spot that depends on your metabolic health. If your mitochondria are in good shape, your gut health is balanced, and your insulin sensitivity is robust, then moderate glucose consumption does wonders. If, on the other hand, you're chronically stressed, sleep-deprived, and overloading on sugar-laden snacks, your body can't handle the onslaught. Dr. Mercola also mentions personal variations, like how certain carbohydrate sources might be better for some people than others. That's an important point. Some of us handle rice better, others might do better with fruits or root vegetables. The goal is to pick carb sources that align with your body's current state. We all have different microbiomes, different metabolic rates, and so on. Let's piece it all together. If I had to summarize, glucose gives a high ATP yield per oxygen. It can still make ATP even when oxygen is scarce. It's a versatile building block for everything from DNA to backup storage in the form of glycogen. Meanwhile, over-reliance on fats can lead to reductive stress, among other issues. But too much glucose also has its own downsides, like glycation and oxidative stress. That's the gist. Glucose is this efficient, flexible fuel that does wonders for your cells when kept in balance. And that's the operative word. Right. Dr. Mercola's essential message is that we want to maximize our mitochondrial efficiency without overloading ourselves on either extreme. Precisely. People sometimes think in black and white terms, fat is good, carbs are bad, or the reverse. But the science suggests a more nuanced picture. Glucose is vital, but so is metabolic equilibrium. You do realize you just tried to use the word nuanced in a world that loves polarizing diet debates? Hey, I live dangerously. Besides, part of our job here is to dig into the science and share what we find, nuances included. We can't just plaster good or bad on entire macronutrients. Fair point. Before we wrap up, let's quickly discuss the pentose phosphate pathway again. That one is so overlooked. It's not about ATP, but about making NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate. Yes, it's crucial. NADPH helps with anabolic reactions, like building up antioxidant defenses, while ribose 5-phosphate is the sugar foundation for DNA and RNA. When cells divide or when tissues need repair, that ribose is essential. So glucose is feeding into that pathway, making life- In other words, it's good to have the raw materials on hand. We can't exactly duct tape our DNA. Precisely, though I'm sure some genius has tried. In the end, the takeaway is that glucose, used wisely, is your cell's best friend. It's a champion of high energy production. It's kinder to your electron transport chain under normal conditions, and it doubles as a building block for other essential molecules. All hail the mighty glucose, but in responsible amounts and from decent sources, not from guzzling sugary soda. Exactly. Let's just say, Dr. Mercola wants us to appreciate glucose's ability to help our cells function optimally without inviting the sugar gremlins in to trash the place. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you unraveling these complexities with your signature comedic flair. If mitochondria could laugh, I'm sure they'd appreciate it too. But I think they'll settle for a well-balanced meal and a healthy oxygen supply. That about does it for today's episode of Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom. I'm Ethan Foster, your humble observer of all things biological. And I'm Alara Skye, proud champion of the comedic deep dive into natural health. Thanks for joining us on this exploration of glucose, reductive stress, and why your cells might actually crave a bit of sweetness. Stay curious, stay balanced, and we'll catch you next time with more cellular insights minus the sugar crash. Until then, keep those mitochondria happy, folks.